Good morning, my fellow Nazis. I'm Wilhelm Wieber, and joined with my co-caster, Eric Bohm. We are here to discuss the signing of the Franco-German Armistice. Henrik Bohm will start us off by asking the first question. Yes, thank you very much, my dear friend Henry. Welcome to my tour of Hitler. In the process of expansion across Western Europe, going against neutral countries like Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, how has your leadership allowed you to bring about such a powerful army, stronger than that of time? My leadership and selection of generals Estimated to about 13.6 million soldiers dedicated to fighting for me and my beloved country has allowed our army to expand their flying colors. Knowing that you recently just signed the armistice in the Campania region of Northern France, what made you want to sign it specifically in that region? I took it upon myself as a deliberate attempt to choose this location because of my profound feeling of vengeance that I got from being forced to watch the signing of the previous armistice. The one from 1918, the one that put the Great War to an end. In other words, there was a significance to that place. Further going into the negotiation of the armistice, what made you want to give someone else the responsibility, specifically Tito, one among many of your officers, of setting the circumstances for where the signing of the armistice was going to be? I decided to give the duty he to Kilo, considering he is one of my most deeply trustworthy soldiers. He also, not to any of my absolute dismay, facilitated the orders regarding the execution of the Jews, along with establishing a military code of conduct. So, we know that there are many countries around neighboring Germany and many Allied powers. What made you want to invade France as the first member of the Allied powers? Unlike any other allied power in the neighboring region, France was the closest when you take into account on their military and naval forces. It was the weakest of the allied force powers. They were so degraded. When it comes to strategy, what did you implement when going to France? As it may already be widely known among the German and community, I decided that the modified version of the Scheiflin plan was the best course of action to take when invading France. The plan involved invading neutral, smaller, neighboring countries of France, which were Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, as has been previously mentioned. Second, I sent a part of the German force to the Ardennes Forest, while another to the weakest part of the Maginot Line. I guess you can say that there is no wonder as to why my people call me the Great Fuhrer. So, what are your future plans with dealing from the acquired land, two-thirds of the whole country of France to be specific, in France as was given by the armistice? To my, to, it's of my deepest desire, out of my most profound nationalist feeling of Germany, my people, superior to all other races, to outright annex the entire space that compromises eastern France, so as to return France to its former borders that were reflected during the period of the Holy Roman Empire. In addition, this land that I now with much certainty will acquire, or I put it to use by using it as a settlement for German peasants and re-Germanizing the current French-speaking population in the region. Having reached a point so far in your journey of conquering Eastern Europe, which country, or countries perhaps, do you want to conquer next? We have an opposition here in the region. What would you? It's one of my future plans to invade Britain, a plan made prior to invading France, using the great plan, Operation Sea Lion. Now being more informed on the so-called Operation Sea Lion, do you mind providing us some details on this operation? Operation Sea Lion, as I have called it, revolves around the German force Luftwaffe of breaking down British defenses by bombing populated areas with thousands of civilians and military bases scattered throughout the country. The invasion, unlike the multi-pivoted one that I carried out in France, will be accomplished through multiple means, land, water, and air. However, just like all the other sectors of my force, I'm sure there's no doubt as to the failure of this one. At about 5 p.m., the first of 400 Heinkel and Dornier bombers began their descent over London. Another 400 arrived around 8 p.m. to continue the attacks. Damage to the docks was devastating. 
and many lives were lost north and south of the river. Ladies and gentlemen, as we have heard it from the tour today, a, un a united German nationalist force is unstoppable. We outnumber every country in every aspect as simply as can be put. Considering the four deaths that we have ducked today, we don't plan on giving <coughs> in any time soon to any of our opposing forces. We will not sacrifice our civilians or resources or time and commitment. It doesn't matter if the puny forces of the country in, in our focus somehow miraculously managed to revolt against us because our great fear will put them down like dogs. Thank you so much for tuning into the Reich Broadcasting Corporation and thank you for joining us, Philip. Thank you.